Welcome back. Our fifth panel topic is surrogate forces and proxies in the Indo-Pacific region. Moderating the panel is Dr. Tom Dolan from the University of Central Florida. Tom's uh, bio is in the program, but he's got the experience in WMD, war termination, insurgency, counterterrorism, strategy, and he's done work, uh, several publications, but his real passion, and one of mine, is World War II era French resistance. Tom's going to further introduce the other panelists, Mr. Will Ir Irwin from Joint Special Operations University, Ambassador Harry Thomas making his second appearance today, who is currently serving as the Department of State Foreign Policy Advisor to the U.S. SOCOM Commander, and my old friend, Colonel Dave Maxwell from the Foundation for Defense Democracies. He's an old friend, and we're both getting kind of old. So, Tom, floor is yours. Thank you very much, General Howard. Um, I'm really excited here uh, to be with you all for this panel. I think we have three excellent panelists and some really interesting uh, topics to, uh, that we'll go through here. Um, you know, each of these uh, countries that we're going to talk about, I think, is in some way a wild card with regard to U.S. strategy in the region. Taiwan's uh, potential uh, for resistance and resilience. The challenges that the Philippine state has had with, uh, with, with terrorism. Uh, and it's and questions about its ability to, to fully resolve those. And then finally, North Korea, one of the great wild cards of the region. Um, we'll start off uh, today with uh, Will Irwin from JSOU, who's going to be talking about Taiwan, resilience and preparation for resistance. Thank you, Tom. And I would uh, also like to thank uh, General Howard, Dr. Wilson, Dr. Marsh uh, for putting this event together and uh, allowing me to be part of it. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has made reunification of Taiwan with mainland China one of its foremost national priorities. Uh, while preferring to accomplish reunification peacefully, Beijing has indicated that it is prepared to use force if necessary, and especially in the event of a declaration of independence by Taiwan. I need to apologize up front. I'm hoping this laryngitis issue I'm battling will uh, cooperate today. My paper is intended to provide a cursory assessment of Taiwan's resistance potential in the face of threatened aggression by China. In calculating the uh, potential for resistance, I, I look specifically at three factors, the terrain, the population, and the potential leadership and role of the resistance. For at least two decades, China has invested heavily in modernizing its armed forces and expanding its capacity for expeditionary operations, resulting in an undeniable quantitative overmatch in strength compared with the armed forces of Taiwan. Resistance on Taiwan, however, could present a, a whole new challenge to the PLA. Active counterinsurgency operations of a kind that are difficult even for the most experienced armies. I began by considering advantages and disadvantages for resistance uh, from a terrain perspective. And generally speaking, the terrain of Taiwan is favorable for resistance activities, either of the urban or rural varieties. Uh, Taiwan's population, which is about 79% urban, is slightly larger than that of the state of Florida, yet its populace occupies an island that is roughly the size of the Florida Panhandle, some 20% of the state's total area. Viewed another way, Taiwan is slightly larger than the state of Maryland, but is home to four times the population of that state. Now, taking that into consideration, uh, you might conclude that resistance activity in Taiwan would be predominantly urban-based, and it could be. However, the uh, island's urban population is mostly concentrated along the northern and western coastal areas. The eastern two-thirds of the island is rugged, mountainous, den densely forested terrain. Some 32% of the island area consists of steep, mountainous terrain over 1,000 meters in elevation, with sev several peaks over 3,000 meters. The majority of the island, in other words, is ideally suited to grow up operations aimed at disrupting occupation force activities. As an island, the greatest challenge facing organized resistance on Taiwan from a terrain perspective 
is the lack of a superior cross-border sanctuary area. History has shown uh, such areas to be critical to effective resistance, providing secure political military base, areas for rebuilding and reorganizing resistance forces, safe from interference by government or occupation forces. Still, some form of sanctuary area might be possible within Taiwan's inner mountainous areas. Probably the most important factor in determining resistance potential is the population itself. Resistance can only effectively be conducted by a population of strong character when it is resilient in the face of occupation, possessed of a strong spirit of opposition, and willing to accept risk to participate. From a historical perspective, Taiwan has limited but important experience in both armed insurgency and nonviolent civil resistance. After fleeing to Taiwan at the close of the Chinese Revolution, the Kuomintang or KMT party ruled under martial law as a one party authoritarian government from 1949 to 1987. Early insurgent political dissent called the Taiwan independence movement remained predominantly nonviolent until around 1970. At that time, a, a violent splinter faction that considered itself an anti-KMT resistance movement organized direct action teams known as uh, commando squads that attacked KMT leaders and interests worldwide. Beginning in the early 1980s, small-scale nonviolent protests became the norm over armed insurgency. With student protest movements in 1990, 2004, 2008, and again in 2014. These student-led acts of civil resistance typically featured protests against further cultural and political assimilation with mainland China. Polls in recent years have shown a notable and revealing decline in the percentage of Taiwan citizens who look favorably upon reunification with mainland China, as well as a striking increase in the percentage of Taiwanese who favor independence, particularly among the younger people. Taiwan Indicators Research conducted a survey in May 2016 that showed 66% of respondents opposing reunification and only 18% favoring it. Much more significant, however, is that 81% of the respondents in the 20 to 29 age group opposed reunification and 72% of that same group supported independence. Beginning around 2000, just as in Hong Kong, identity increasingly became the prominent cause of protest campaigns as Taiwanese identity progressively displaced Chinese identity among the residents. National identity is important in uniting and bonding members of a society as citizens of a country, and it plays a pivotal role in enabling important trust, interdependency, and mutual security aspects of resistance. It is there, therefore interesting to examine how the citizens of Taiwan identify themselves, and there has been a dramatic shift over the last two decades. As Pew Research indicates, two-thirds of the population now embracing a distinct Taiwanese identity, whereas in the 1990s, only 18% identified themselves as only Taiwanese, the majority at that time considering themselves wholly or partly Chinese. The Taipei government should consider the total defense concept promoted in the resistance operating concept written by Dr. Otto Fiala and published by JSO in 2020, where pre-planned and prepared resistance is part of the government's national security strategy, just as was done in Switzerland during the Cold War and is currently being done in the Baltic states. Under such a pre-planned resistance strategy, uh, senior resistance leaders could be appointed in advance by the military. They might come from the Army's reserve forces and could participate in planning and preparation for the defense of Taiwan. Resistance forces under military control can initially serve as an auxiliary to the main and reserve combat forces, a force multiplier capable of impeding the progress of invading forces and carrying out operations in rugged terrain thus freeing up conventional forces for duty elsewhere. In the unfortunate event of successful invasion and occupation by the PLA, uh, they could revert to a more traditional resistance role until such time as possible external help arrives. 
In the final assessment, the truly critical battle space in the China-Taiwan standoff is in the minds of the people of Taiwan, where defeatism may pose the greatest danger. What is needed is a concerted effort on the part of the Taipei government to educate its citizens on the effective defense that could result from an integrated military civilian effort with a strong military active in the reserve, backed by a highly motivated, prepared, and capable resistance force. And with that, Tom, I'll close and hand it back over to you. Thank you very much, Will. Very much appreciate that. Next, uh, we have Ambassador Harry Thomas, who's going to talk to us about the Philippines and ter their terrorism challenge. Good afternoon. Uh, please share the screen. I sent up some uh, slides. Uh, but first, I want to thank Dr. Marsh for inviting me, uh, Mr. Dolan for moderating it, uh, my Mr. Larry Cook, my Sovereign Challenge colleagues, as well as uh, Captain Gus Gustantine, a retired Navy SEAL who helped me with this presentation. Do I have the slides up? Um, if they don't have the slides, which were sent up, I will just talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's interesting. The Philippines has 300,000 square kilometers. Oh, here they go. Thank you. Can the Philippines address its terrorist challenges? Let's find out. Let's find out the history, the, the demographics, as well as the geographic challenges. Next slide, please. When we look at the Philippines, we can see 7,641 islands. They've even found more islands in the last few years. Only a couple thousand are inhabited. The main area we're going to talk about today is Mindanao, the second largest island and a major producer of agricultural commodities in the country. Next slide. You look at the bottom, you'll see that Mindanao is in the red with the yellow, uh, green, and you'll see something that says ARMM. That's the Autonomous Regional area of Muslim Mindanao. And that area has been some place where the U.S. has had troops on and off since 1900. And they're still insurgents. So something is not going right. <clears throat> In the interest of time, I'm going to summarize my thoughts and then I'll come back. For this to happen, the Philippines will have to do some heavy lifting. But there is a terrorism off ramp. Next slide. They have to make national unity and social cohesion the national priority. Recognize, celebrate the pl plurality of Republic of Philippines synergy. This is a critical path item. Create a new partnership with the US, Japan, Korea, the EU, and ASEAN nations that share concerns regarding China. Regional partners must cooperate to reduce extremism and violence. Engage the southern Philippines, Mindanao, and nearby islands heavily but with a light cultural touch. Advance the national governance through a development and autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao accommodation measures. Now, out of the box thinking, this is just my own personal, um, unprecedented satellite surveillance of the archipelago. Maybe Elon Musk. Enlist him. Now, what are the landmines? Pervasive corruption in local regional politicians, informal alignment and with and sympathy for terrorist organization among the leadership all the way down to the clans. In 2022, next slide please, the Philippines will have presidential elections and the best we can hope for is that the candidates look to improve governance and living conditions that contributed to terrorism that has harmed the Southern Philippines for centuries. My talk is centering on Muslim insurgencies in the South, but the Philippines is plagued by the Communist New People's Army and war-led groups in the center and north. 
There is insufficient time to discuss the 2017 clashes between the government and armed insurgents in Mindanao that led to martial law, but we know the United States uh, very much helped the Philippines with this effort. Next slide. U.S. military aid to the Philippines has steadily increased in the last decade to better prepare a treaty ally to respond to Chinese aggression and help build the armed forces of the Philippines' counterterrorism capacity and humanitarian response capability. The United States will provide $428 million in assistance to Manila in fiscal year 22, with $225 million coming from DDOD, making the Philippines our largest aid recipient in Asia. We understand the AFP is a strong supporter of U.S. initiatives in the country and the region, but we are strongly committed to the Philippines and have to ask, what are we getting for our investment? During my tenure in the Philippines of 2010 to 2013, we worked closely with the talented, brave, and innovative Jasota P to assist the military, but it's doubtful that Manila can end terrorism. This is a several hundred year challenge that requires long-term social, political, and economic changes that require attitudinal and behavioral changes by the Philippine public. Next slide. Let's go to context. Terrorism. From the perspective of victims, terrorism is a terrible thing, a crime against humanity. But from the perpetrator's perspective, it is an act of courage from which virtue and honor spring. Thus, does the economy of terror look different depending on which position of the exchange you're located? Next slide. Uh, Ambassador Ahmed Ahmed argues that the inability for Muslim and non-Muslim states alike to either incorporate minority groups into a liberal and tolerant society or resolve the center versus periphery conflict is emblematic of a systematic failure of the modern state a breakdown which is more often than not leads to widespread violence and destruction. The violence generated from these conflicts will become the focus in the remainder of the 21st century. And all of those dealing with these issues of national integration, law and order, human rights and justice. Next, history. The fighting was the fiercest I've ever seen. General John Pershing, who led US forces in Mindanao wrote to his wife, the Moro warriors, he said, were absolutely fearless. Now, Moro is, in fact, this word has a long, complicated history. The term Moros is Spanish for Moors, to gain, referencing the North African Muslims who conquered Spain in 711. To gain sympathy and support of Christianized native Filipinos, the Spaniards infused the term Moro with derogatory connotations such as pirates, traitors, until the emergence of the Moro Liberation Front in 1969, the people of Moroland refused to be called Moros. If you can look at the map, you can see how far and how large um, Mindanao is and how far it is from the center. Next slide. These myths persist. The majority of respondents in a national survey said they think Muslims are more prone to run amok and nearly half the respondents think that Muslims are terrorists or extremists, harbor hatred toward non-Muslims and do not consider themselves Filipinos. The report also noted that only 14% of survey respondents had actually interacted with a Muslim Filipino. This is in a heavily uh, Christian country. Next slide, the Tausugs. The Taosugs are one of the largest of the ethnic groups of the Southwest Philippines. They live primarily in the Sulu Archipelago, southwest of the island of Mindanao, mainly in the Holo Island Cluster. There are, however, significant migrant or migrant communities of Taosugs in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Borneo. I will skip down, but I've gone through the history of the Taosugs and how they have been fighting the center, who have they perceived the center for over 500 years, and how they remain impoverished in the absence of jobs, young men turn to looting and piracy. The Taosugs do not consider themselves Filipinos. Their clan is more important to them. We have to understand that. 
and the relationship they've had with the center has always been complicated. They belong to MILF, MNLF, and Abu Sayyaf, and even some to JI. <clears throat> USAID and Jasodif P worked together to separately and together. And this is what we have to do in many places. USAID provided 60% of its assistance to Mindanao of the Philippines, but was often unable to go and inspect, monitor um, the work. So we relied on Jasota P who's no longer there. So this task has become much markedly harder for the Philippines and for USAID. Again, I was a witness in 2013, uh, sat right next to President Aquino for uh, six hours as he negotiated with the MNLF to a peace agreement. But that was only a partial peace agreement because that was one of only several organizations. So what happens when one gets something and others do not? They rebelled. And that happened in 2013. Despite having Jasota P there, a local contact had to uh, call me and alert me to what was going on. And I had to uh, contact our Jasota P uh, who worked with the Filipinos to repel what was really an invasion from Holu, Tawi Tawi uh, and other places. Um, and these things will continue to go on as we know. So as in conclusion, possible next steps. Development solutions can only work if they have the so full support of the clans that decide local politics, which is no easy task. Considering the tenacity with which clans can fight over resources, yet with a holistic plan of engagement in the context of true autonomy, it is possible to bring them together. Mediation, what can the US do? Understand the history and culture, train, advise, and assist, assist Philippine government planning and assessments, maintain Philippine sovereignty and leadership, improve armed forces of Philippines capabilities, enhance legitimacy of national and local governments, and decrease support for terrorists. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Ambassador. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Colonel Dave Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you to uh, Jay Sao. Uh, good to see you, General Howard, uh, and uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity really to discuss a subject. I don't think it's enough exposure, despite North Korea being in the news uh, so often. Um, in today's great power competition, we face the revisionist powers of China and Russia, the rogue powers of Iran and North Korea, and of course, the continuing threat of violent extremist organizations. And we think of GPC, great power competition, as mainly involving the US and allies versus China and Russia and like-minded authoritarian governments. And my assessment of China uh, sums up my view of really our major competitor of in, within uh, great power competition. Uh, China seeks to export its authoritarian political system around the world uh, in order to dominate regions, co-opt or coerce international organizations, uh, create economic conditions favorable to China alone, and displace democratic institutions. Now, of the four revisionist and rogue powers, we tend to isolate North Korea as a separate and often lesser included case uh, within the larger national security challenges, and also because of its perceived uh, geographic confines to Northeast Asia. However, I would argue that the Kim family regime is actually a global problem, uh, and that one that, that could be a spoiler in great power competition. Now, what is a spoiler? Uh, the extreme type uh, in the international relations theory uh, uh, theories are, uh, it's the total spoiler, which is defined as groups or individuals that will never compromise or negotiate. You know, although the international relations theorists say this is actually uh, quite rare, extremely rare, uh, I would argue that it applies to North Korea and that, ha and that has important implications uh, for the US and all of the, uh, the powers competing in great power competition. Uh, North Korea has the potential through words and deeds to upend cooperation and competition, uh, and this could lead to conflict. And what makes North Korea a spoiler most of all? Uh, it's absolute unwillingness to negotiate the denuclearization of North Korea. And it is its nuclear weapons that provide it the ability to operate around the world to achieve its objectives. Uh, and this can put a wrench in great power competition. 
And we must understand that uh, North Korea is a self-described revolutionary power, as is Iran. So I like to call it a rogue and revolutionary power. Uh, North Korea's constitution and Workers' Party of, of Korea charter call for it to complete the revolution to rid the peninsula of foreign influence uh, and unify it under what I like to describe as the guerrilla dynasty and gulag state to support the single vital interest, which is survival of the mafia-like crime family cult known as the Kim family regime. Uh, it's employing a seven decades old strategy of subversion, coercion, extortion, uh, and blackmail diplomacy, and the potential use of force to achieve unification on its terms. It's conducting a long con to obtain sanctions relief while keeping uh, uh, its nuclear weapons and military capabilities intact uh, for future use. It's using blackmail diplomacy, which is described as increased tension, threats, and provocations to gain political and economic concessions. And finally, it is conducting political warfare, political warfare with Juche characteristics. And of course, political warfare is the use of all means other than military force to compel an opponent to do one's will. Uh, and the exercise of political warfare uh, reflects a hostile intent. Uh, the North conducts political warfare against its own people, the ROC, Japan, the US, and dating back to the Korean War, even China and Russia. And as uh, my good friend, Lieutenant General, uh, retired in uh, Chun in uh, writes uh, and has written, other adversaries in the world recognize the success of North, uh, the North Korean regime and hope to emulate its success. Uh, this in turn is a new source of danger uh, and a potential threat to the international order in the free world. It can make North Korea into another form of a spoiler. While we think of North Korea as isolated between China and the ROC, another way to view its location is at the nexus of the second, third, and 10th largest economies in the world. Two nuclear powers, Russia and China, uh, and very large conventional militaries in the region. But North Korea also has a very long reach uh, through its global illicit activities, proliferation, overseas slave labor, cyber operations, and the like. Uh, its weapons proliferation relationship with Iran actually completes the circle of revisionist and rogue powers, uh, making North Korea's ge geostrategic location uh, very important. And of course, if there is instability and regime collapse, or God forbid, if there is war, uh, it will have global effects due to its relationship uh, with the countries of the region uh, and their connections with the rest of the world. And of course, war on the Korean peninsula would itself be the ultimate spoiler. Now, of course, the US-PRC relationship is complicated by North Korea. China has the three no's of no war, no instability or regime collapse, and no nuclear weapons. And while the US desires Chinese help in negotiating the denuclearization of the North, uh, China has been unwilling to exert sufficient pressure to force denuclearization, as well as, you know, on the contrary, to provide aid to allow North Korea to bring itself out of its economic hole. It simply wants to maintain the status quo and let North Korea be a problem for the ROC and the US. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that the PRC and North Korea do not have a great love for each other. It's a marriage of convenience uh, or even a shotgun marriage. Uh, although they are the only two allies each has uh, and their propaganda describes uh, their, uh, their relationship as being closer than lips and teeth, China has never forgotten that it was Kim Il-sung who duped both Mao and Stalin into allowing him to attack South Korea in 1950. This in turn prevented Mao from achieving his planned unification with Taiwan that year. Uh, so there's long memories in China and, uh, you know, and that persists to this day because you know, China remains divided, uh, as divided as Korea. So there's no love lost between the PRC and North Korea. And furthermore, the US cannot expect China to help solve its security problems in the region. Now, like most countries, uh, North Korea acts, only acts in its interests. Uh, but it, I think it takes it to its extreme. And for, for 70 years, it has demonstrated the ability to deftly play members of the international community uh, against each other. Uh, one of its main interests, of course, is to obtain hard currency for its royal court economy. Uh, it's doing this in myriad ways from smuggling, drug trafficking, slave labor, uh, and counterfeiting around the world to include counterfeiting US $100 bills. Its United Front Department and Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is roughly the equivalent of US SOCOM and the CIA, through its 225th Bureau is conducting an active campaign of subversion uh, against South Korea uh, in an attempt to destabilize it uh, in support of the North's political warfare strategy. And of course, the regime's so-called all-purpose sword of cyber operations is growing in capability. While we focus on the Sony hack, 
Uh, we should look at what it has done to the medical systems in London and Atlanta with its ransomware, the $80 million theft from Bangladesh, uh, the Chilean banking system ATM theft, uh, and of course the daily attacks on South Korean infrastructure, among many other reports of sophisticated uh, and growing cyber operations. Lastly, it is conducting proliferation of weapons and training to conflict areas in the Middle East and Africa. You know, note the scuds the Houthis have uh, in Yemen are, are using. Uh, these come from Iran, who purchased them from North Korea. North Korea has provided extensive help uh, to the Iranian uh, missile program uh, and development program. In fact, as Dr. Bruce Bechtel has noted, if you see it in North Korea, you will eventually see it in Iran. Uh, and we should be grateful to Israel uh, for destroying the nuclear reactor that was under development in Syria in 2007. Uh, this was being built with the help of North Korean technology and advisors. Now, let me stop and conclude here. We cannot think of North Korea as simply a shrimp among whales uh, that is confined strictly to a small piece of territory in Northeast Asia. Yes, North Korea poses an existential threat to South Korea as it seeks to dominate the peninsula, either through political warfare and subversion or the actual use of force. But the problems North Korea generates go far beyond Northeast Asia. And as long as it retains its nuclear program, it will have the freedom of action to do whatever is necessary to generate the resources for the regime to survive. And this could serve as a spoiler in Asia and other parts of the world, and I think cause even greater friction uh, within great power competition. Uh, so thank you, and I look forward to uh, the Q&A. Thank you all very much. I very much appreciate your uh, very interesting uh, presentations. I'm gonna start off with a question for, um, for everyone. I'm gonna, gonna borrow from uh, Dave's uh, metaphor there of spoilers and you know maybe perhaps wild cards. When you think about each of the different countries and the issues that you raised with each of these different countries, for whom are these spoiling effects most serious? Uh, you know, I can think about you know certainly North Korea is an obvious spoiler for the United States, but as you mentioned, it could also be a spoiler for uh, the People's Republic of China. When we think about uh, terrorists in the Philippines. We can, you know, this could have a number of different effects that could affect uh, not only the United States, but other countries' uh, relations with the Philippines and in that area. So how did, how, what potential spoiling effects could we see there? And finally, you know, if we think about the, the prospect of a, a Taiwanese uh, resistance movement, certainly that could, you know, potentially spoil plans for a quick invasion on the Chinese side. But that might also be a risk to the United States, uh, particularly if the United States finds itself in a position where it wishes to extricate itself from the situation more quickly, as is at least conceptually possible. So, you know, for whom are these, you know, the, these spoiling these spoilers, you know, the greatest risk? And where are the opportunities for the United States in these different spoilers? Uh, who, who, who'd like to go first? Uh, I'll go first, Tom. The, uh, talking about the resistance on uh, Taiwan, perhaps the greatest spoiler, as I mentioned towards the end of my talk, is uh, in the minds of the people of Taiwan and uh, whether or not they're prepared to defend the country conventionally, let alone taking part in resistance. Uh, some of the, there were reports that have come out just in the past couple of months about the uh, the problems they're having. You know, they're trying to transition uh, to a an all volunteer military, and it's having an impact. They're being challenged right now, filling the ranks. Uh, just a month or two ago, I saw figures where your overall armed forces are at about eighty percent of their authorized strength. Frontline units at around sixty percent. And uh, just two weeks ago, in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article uh, talking about uh, another survey had been conducted over there. And it said that uh, the majority, based on the results of that survey, the majority of the people at Taiwan simply don't believe the Chinese, Chinese will ever attack. So uh, pretty challenging to put together a resistance movement uh, in, in a place like that. Possibly. Certainly, possibly. Yes, uh, thank you. I think the spoiler effect in the Philippines is twofold. One is the Filipino people. Um, these are these terrorists. These are many terrorist groups. They're varied. 
Um, they can be a terrorist one day, a baker another day. They move from terrorist group to terrorist group because of Klan organizations. But let's not forget, uh, while I was there, uh, these terrorist groups engaged in kidnapping American citizens. Uh, some we got back, others uh, passed away. That continues. Umar Patek, the Indonesian Bali bomber, married a Filipina and hid out in Mindanao before he went to Pakistan. So Malaysia trying, we need to have a, a, a strategy that incorporates Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Southern Philippines. But unless the Philippines improves its weak governance and lack of corruption and gives some leeway to uh, the locals, um, it'll remain a major challenge for us. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, I think all these areas can be spoilers. I think as you you're really implying, um, and and I think you know first and foremost, I think they can have an effect uh, in their local geographic area with their main competitors uh, and and upend uh, uh, upend things. Um, but what I think is really important uh, and common in dealing with all of these um, and the opportunity that you're really asking about, and this is what I'd really like to get at, is. First and foremost, we need to understand the strategies, how they can be a spoiler, why they would be a spoiler. We need to expose those strategies uh, because uh, that can help undermine the legitimacy of those strategies and the legitimacy of those spoiling actors. Uh, and then, of course, we can devise uh, political, economic, uh, information, diplomatic, and, and military action to counter them. But I, I'd really uh, you know, like to make the point that Thinking of them as spoilers is one way to analyze the situation. Uh, but even if they're not spoilers, I think we need deep understanding of these problems and we need to identify their strategies and be able to expose them. And, and that's got to be part of our influence campaign, information influence activities uh, to expose strategies. I think Sun Tzu said, it, you know, what is of supreme importance is to attack the enemy's strategy. First, you've got to expose it. You know, first you understand it, then expose it, and then we can attack it. And, and that's what I think is the common opportunity uh, in all these areas. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I have a couple more questions, um, uh, more individual questions. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of work through the, the order that we went before. So, um, Will, you know, I think there's some really interesting uh, issues that you raise here. Uh, what I think about um, you know, resistance, I always think about, you know, what does the occupation look like? Because the shape and character of the occupation has a strong influence on the character of resistance and even the possibility of resistance, right? Uh, so, you know, I kind of wonder, you know, what, what do you think a Chinese occupation would look like? Would this look more like Hong Kong? Would this look more like Zhangjiang? And what role would things like, uh, Chinese, you know, Chinese monitoring uh, technology, you know, the, the deployment of things like AI and so forth, uh, have on the prospects, do you think, of a uh, possible resistance movement in Taiwan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it would have uh, a real limiting effect on uh, mobilization for resistance. I would, I would guess that uh, occupation there would be pretty iron fisted, uh, kind of like Hong Kong, where they really shut down the, uh, the civil resistance there pretty quick. And, and China has the control measures and the experience in using them. So I don't, I don't think they would have much problem in doing that and uh, nothing to really keep them from doing it. Um, so I, I, I guess uh, occupation there to me would be pretty much like in uh, Hong Kong. Okay. Okay. Um, I know that Dave actually has a kind of a follow-up question for you as well, Will. So I'll just let him go right now. Yeah. Thanks, Will. I, I agree. Uh, I think the concept of resistance is something that uh, Taiwan should pursue, though. Uh, you know, I think that uh, Bob Jones's concept of unconventional deterrence, uh, you know, creating the conditions uh, that would make it unfavorable for, for China to invade, uh, you know, or want to invade, uh, you know, would, uh, you know, and, and, you know, turn Taiwan into a black hole that would just absorb the PLA and all those only children of, of Chinese families, you know, with their one child policy uh, would, uh, would end their lives in Taiwan trying to uh, quell that. But one of the things I get pushback on 
uh, when I talk about resistance in Taiwan, uh, it's kind of what you just alluded to. Uh, you know, they say that well, China has a lot of a lot of experience with people's war, uh, and you know, they conducted people's war, Mao's people's war, so they they should by nature uh, uh, know how to uh, counter it. Uh, but you know, if they impose, as you were talking about, the you know highly restrictive and, and draconian population and resources control measures, would that really have an effect on uh, you know pacifying uh, a, a developed resistance? You know, or would that backfire? And so, I guess my real question is: Do you really think China has, because of its experience with people's war, that it would really be effective? Uh, you know, after an invasion of uh, being able to pacify uh, the resistance in Taiwan? And, or does that experience in people's war really translate uh, well to, uh, to pacifying a, resistant, a resisting population? Yeah, great question, Dave. Um, no, I, I completely agree with Bob in the uh, conventional, unconventional deterrence thing. You know, people who have lived in a vibrant democracy for many, many years, like the people in Taiwan have, don't really have a much of a problem being motivated to push back against uh, a harsh occupation like that. So, yeah, I I, uh, I didn't mean to imply that the, there's no chance for resistance there because I think there is. Uh, it's just it's a very unique situation when you look at Taiwan. Their their greatest national security threat is also their greatest uh, economic partner, trading partner, investment recipient. It's kind of a, a really unusual situation. So people uh, to join the resistance, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, they have the, the regular uh, physical risks involved with that, but they have a lot of other risks too, economic risks and, and things like that that we don't often think of. Thank you. Ambassador, I have a question for you. I want to kind of preface this by saying, in some ways, your presentation was just remarkably pessimistic. At one point, you said it is doubtful that Manila can end terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of described this as a, as a centuries long problem that might take a century or more to fix. So, given that, what's the best way to proceed? You know, are there discrete, you know, are there discrete specific things that can be done? Uh, perhaps by, you know, uh, partners like the U.S., but you know, also by, I presume, the Filipinos themselves. Well, I'm not being pessimistic, Tom. I'm just being honest. You know, we can't have a solution to every challenge, mm -hmm. and we we know that something that Pershing was fighting, <laughs> that we're still fighting today. There has to be another reason and not a military solution. Uh, but look, when most Filipinos do not view the Muslims in the South as even common citizenry, then you have to have attitudinal and behavioral changes. The terrible thing is that these um, people who have become terrorists, um, they are, they've become, you know, the oppressed become the oppressors and they are oppressing. And the people, we, we don't have a great history there. We can remember our recent history, but we promised them independence in 1900 if they fought against the center. We forget those things, they do not. So expecting us to uh, rid not only the Southern Philippines, but Indonesia, Malaysia of terrorism is, is naive. Um, what we can do is work with governments of the day to slowly improve uh, education, attitudes, opportunity. That's quite different, um, pardon me, with the current, current government in the, in the Philippines. I mean, just look at uh, the things Duterte said even this week. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question for Will. You're popular today. Given your expertise on resistance and resilience, can you share with the audience some of the main findings from your trilogy on resistance uh, published by the JSOU Press? Well, I, I guess the main thing uh, and that came out in the, uh, I guess, the first volume and I, I looked at uh, a long list of uh, case studies of U.S. support to resistance and looked at the purpose that the, the, uh, the missions, the operations had in terms of whether it was for regime change or whether it was 
coercion to coerce the enemy into changing the policy or whatever, or disruption. And of the three, uh, it, it turned out that coercion was uh, the most successful purpose for conducting UW, uh, the least successful were operations done uh, for regime change. Uh, they were only successful, uh, if I recall, about 25% of the time. But that, that was the main findings of that moment. But the, another thing is just the wide variety of ways uh, UW has been conducted. You know, every case study is different. Conditions are different. The, uh, the uh, proxy is different. Uh, it's real. It's really amazing. So, to me, one of the most interesting cases was uh, UW that we did in in uh, support of the Thai resistance in World War II, which most people have never heard of. And that was just a very successful operation, and it was instigated by the State Department, who asked the OSS to do that. A lot of interesting stories there. That's really interesting. You know. It's certainly the case that we can learn a lot from you know, these historical cases. You know, as you pursued your, your ideas about you know possible Taiwanese resistance, what cases do you think are most useful for us to look at? Uh, I thought of that, and it's it's hard to draw a parallel. With any, if you look at uh, you know after Vietnam, uh, we went through a period of war weariness like we are right now, and proxy warfare really kind of became the, the normal American intervention uh, means for a while. But everywhere we intervened, uh, Angolan Civil War, uh, Nicaragua, uh, we all, Afghanistan, we were always able to support those movements from a friendly foreign country next door. Honduras for, our, for Nicaragua, Pakistan for Afghanistan couple of friendly countries in Africa. How would we do that for an island nation where there are no countries at all, let alone friendly countries around it? I mean, uh, we have to kind of reimagine how we would conduct UW in support of our resistance movement there. It's pretty challenging, but it's also interesting to think about how we might do that. And to me, the model to look at is the way we supported the Philippine resistance in World War II. You know, much of our doctrine and uh, thinking is based on the way the OSS did it during World War II, uh, using platforms of uh, the car carpet baggage, for example, and all the air support throughout Europe and the Mediterranean and in Burma. Uh, the way we supported the resistance in the Philippines uh, wasn't like that at all. It, it probably had a lot to do with the distance between there and General MacArthur's headquarters in Australia. Uh, so he didn't, he, he was very active in supporting the resistance, but what he did, he had a small fleet of submarines, and that's how they provided all the logistical support, how they inserted people. And uh, if you read the, uh, the war memoirs, of people like Russell Volkman, uh, who was American officer leading one of the largest resistance groups in Luzon, and of course in 1951-52, he was in the Pentagon involved in that small group of guys who developed the concept for our current special forces. But if you read his memoirs, uh, they relied a lot on those submarine resupply missions. So maybe that's the model we need to look at. Thanks, that's really interesting. Next question for Dave. Um, this comes from the audience. So do you think that the DPRK would compromise or negotiate if given a JCPOA under the current administration or something like a JCPOA? Yeah, so I, I think, um, uh, you know, that's a, a real point of discussion now. And really, uh, one of the things, you know, some of the pundits are proposing really arms control negotiations with, uh, with North Korea. Um, I, I think they would very much accept that. Uh, and they very much want that. Because if they get arms control negotiations, if they get a JCPOA, it means that they are they become a de facto nuclear power. Uh, they will keep their nuclear weapons, uh, and you know while they might, I mean they they want salt and start you know strategic arms limitation talks, strategic arms reduction talks. 
um, we should ask ourselves, you know, if we're going to enter into those kind of arms control negotiations, like we did with the, the Soviets, what are we going to reduce? What are we going to give up? You know, which uh, I think that's not a, not, it's not a good, uh, uh, not a good equation there. But the real problem with a JCPOA for North Korea is that Kim Jong-un will assess his blackmail diplomacy, his long con, and his political warfare strategy as successful. Uh, that he will extract concessions uh, from the U.S. and the West, he will keep his nuclear weapons, and he will be able to continue to develop his military capabilities uh, and conduct his subversive activities uh, to pursue his strategic aim, which is unification of the peninsula on its terms uh, to support its single vital national interests, survival of the Kim family regime. So I'm opposed to a JCPOA uh, or any kinds of arms control negotiations. Um, I think that that would just cause Kim Jong-un to, to double down on his strategy uh, and it would you know, continue provocations and of course, always have the potential to lead to miscalculation uh, and, uh, and ultimately conflict. Thanks. And I have another question for you as well, also from the audience. It says, the DPRK has shown the capability to use CWA on a small scale. Do you assess that they have a larger capability that they would use offensively in conflict? Well, most of the uh, open source intelligence estimates that uh, that we've seen is that they, you know, we, we kind of throw around 5,000 tons of chemical weapons, you know, as well as a biological weapons program uh, as well. Um, I, I believe that if they have chemical weapons, just like having nuclear weapons, they have the intent to use them in conflict. Uh, you know, quickly, North Korea's strategy uh, is much like 1950. To be successful, they have to rapidly attack South Korea and occupy the entire peninsula before the United States can uh, reinforce the peninsula. I mean, that's really its campaign plan in a nutshell. And to do that, we are likely to see at least the use of chemical weapons on ports like Pusan, Piantek, uh, Pohong, uh, you know, Chinhe, uh, to prevent that reinforcement. Uh, and so I think that, and of course, I also think that they do not view uh, weapons of mass destruction with the same taboo that we do. Uh, they are tools to be used uh, in support of their objectives, uh, even though you know, our declaratory policy says that we can respond uh, to use of weapons of mass destruction. You know, we can have decisive uh, response to include nuclear weapons. Uh, I think if they go to war, they're going to use all their capabilities, uh, and that includes the full range of weapons of mass destruction. And so we need to prepare for that uh, if there is conflict, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you for that really great answer to that question. Um, we're approaching the end of our time. So does anyone have any final thoughts that they'd uh, like to share before we hand back off to General Howard? We'll start with Will. Uh, the only final thoughts I have, I, I, I do have a question I'd like to ask Dave. Uh, you know, from time to time, we see a, a North Korean soldier make it across the border in South Korea. And I'm just wondering in all your research, if you've seen any uh, indication of dissension, dis disenchantment among the ranks there? Yeah, I, I just did a, um, a, a, last week was North Korea Freedom Week, and I did a panel uh, with uh, four escapees uh, from the North. And, you know, they are adamant that there is a thirst for information in the North. Uh, they are willing to risk uh, the punishment to receive information uh, because they want to know the truth of the outside world. Most of the escapees, defectors, uh, I like to call them escapees rather than the pejorative defectors, uh, most of them, uh, when they learn the truth, you know, they tell us that, you know, they wanted to come, they wanted freedom. You know, they, they really learn freedom uh, from, uh, uh, from information of the outside world. Uh, so uh, there is, I think, nascent resistant potential. We, we see, uh, you know, going back to the Sixth Corps back in the 90s uh, that was, that, you know, tried the coup. We see all of the uh, resistance against, uh, you know, monuments and statues, particularly up in the north along Haesung. Uh, there's lots of indicators uh, that, uh, and, and of course, uh, the military, uh, you know, lots of problems within the military now. Um, there's potential, but there's really no way to exploit it internally. Uh, and and I would just say as a, as a uh, and I'll make this my concluding statement for you, uh, Tom, is that North Korea is the most ripe country 
for information influence activities. It's a, a laboratory for psychological operations. And I would recommend SOCOM really dedicate efforts uh, to uh, conducting a holistic, sophisticated information influence ca activities campaign uh, in North Korea, understanding the political problems we have with our ally in the South, uh, which is a whole other discussion I could have. But uh, I'll make that my concluding comment, Tom. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Final yeah, uh, thank you. I really do think that the United States presence in the Philippines, the military presence, development uh, presence and assistance is a force for good and change and role model. And that being there using it mutually beneficial reasons is critical. And that the Philippines is one of the nations in our chain of pearls for Chinese deterrence from uh, North Asia all the way down to Australia. And we have to, to remember that. Uh, but we can't be naive and expect quick solutions, uh, especially when we have imperfect partners. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, all three of our presenters. This has been, a, I think, a really great discussion and I'm glad that I was able to take part. If we were with people in person, I'd meet everyone in a round of applause. So take that as given. And with that, I'll hand off back to uh, General Howard. Thank you, Tom. Well, final panel was outstanding. Uh, thank our ambassador for making two appearances today. We've covered many interesting, relevant in topics from the evolution of great power competition to strategic competition. Our discussion has spanned the globe from China, East Asia, South America, Africa. Tomorrow, we will continue our discussion with an in-depth look at strategic culture, both China and Russia, and also experience an outstanding keynote address to be delivered by Brigadier General Joshua Rudd, Commander of Special Operations Command Pacific, a truly boots-on-the-ground commander.